did not know that. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today in fellowship on the 25th of the fourth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it. And it is also, oh, I believe it's the uh, 9th of July on the Gregorian calendar, 2022. And before we get started, we we're continuing with our reading of recognitions if we get onto it today. We're going to do a little segue here and cover what's called Josephus's discourse to the Greeks concerning Hades. And our brother had a question about what was under the earth, and this has a pretty interesting uh, description of it. So, without further ado, this is an extract out of Josephus' Discourse to the Greeks Concerning Hades, which is Sheol, or the grave. Now, as to the grave, wherein the inner beings of the righteous and unrighteous are detained, it is necessary to speak of it. Sheol, or the grave, is a place in the world not regularly fin finished, a subterraneous region wherein the light of this world does not shine, from which circumstance that in this region the light does not shine. It cannot be, but there must be in it perpetual darkness. This region is allotted as a place of, custo of custody, sorry, for souls or inner beings, in which Malachim messengers are appointed as guardians to them, who disturb it to them temporary punishments agreeable to everyone's behavior and manners. Now, it says temporary punishments here. That's not necessarily accurate. It could be you're in shalom or you're you're confounded and, and punished in a sense but not everybody is suffering. In this region, there is a certain place set apart as a lake of unquenchable fire, which we call magma or lava, right? Wherein too, we suppose no one has as yet or as of yet been cast, but it is prepared for a day afore determined by Elohim in which one righteous sentence shall deservedly be passed upon all men, when the unrighteous and those that have been disobedient to Elohim and have given honor to such idols as have been the vain operations of the hands of men, as to Elohim himself, shall be adjudged to the everlasting punishment, as having been the causes of defilement, while the righteous shall obtain an incorruptible and never fading kingdom. These are now indeed confined in Sheol, but not in the same place wherein the unrighteous are confined. For there is one descent into this region, at whose gate we believe there stands a chief messenger with a host. Which gate, when those pass through, that are conducted down by the messengers appointed over inner beings, they do not go the same way. But the righteous are guided to the right hand, and are led with hymns sung by the messengers appointed over that place, unto a region of light, in which the righteous have dwelt from the beginning of the world, not constrained by necessity, but ever enjoying the prospect of the good things they see and rejoice in the expectation of those new enjoyments, which will be peculiar to every one of them, meaning their future reward. And esteeming those things beyond what we have here, with whom there is no place of toil, no burning heat, no piercing cold, nor are any briars there, but the continuance of the fathers and of the righteous, which they are so the countenance of the fathers and of the righteous, which they see, always smiles upon them while they wait for that rest and eternal new life in Shemaim, which is to succeed this region. This place we call the bosom of Abraham. And the earliest reference to the bosom of Abraham I'm familiar with is actually 
in an allegorical form in the book of Yobelim, where in the death of Abraham, Yaakov as a child was laying in his bosom when Abraham passed away. <clears throat> but as to the unrighteous, <clears throat> They are dragged by force to the left hand by the messengers allotted for punishment, no longer going with a good will, but as prisoners driven by violence, to whom are sent the messengers appointed over them to reproach them and threaten them with their terrible looks, and to thrust them still downwards. Now those messengers that are set over these inner beings drag them into the neighborhood of hell itself, who when they are hard by it, continually hear the noise of it, and do not stand clear of the hot vapor itself. But when they have a near view of this spectacle, as of a terrible and exceeding great prospect of fire, they are struck with a fearful expectation of a future judgment, and in effect punished thereby. And not only so, but where they see the place of the fathers and of the righteous, even hereby they are punished. For a chaos deep and large is fixed between them, inasmuch that a righteous man that has compassion upon them cannot be admitted nor can anyone that is unrighteous, if he were bold enough to attempt it, pass over it. <clears throat> and this is what was alluded to in the parable of our Mashiach with Lazarus and the rich man, with the bosom of Abraham and the large gap between them. This is the discourse concerning Sheol, wherein the inner beings of all men are confined until a proper season which Elohim has determined when he will make a resurrection of all men from the dead, not procuring a transmitigation of inner beings from one body to another, but raising again those very bodies. Yeah, so no reincarnation for anyone who is thinking that was something that you do, but you, your very body that you have is what will be returned to you, right? Which you Greeks seen to be dissolved, do not believe, but learn not to disbelieve it. For while you believe that the inner being or soul is created and yet is made immortal by Elohim, according to the doctrine of Plato and this in time, be not incredulous, but believe that Elohim is able when he has raised to life that body which was made as a compound of the same elements to make it immortal. For it must never be said of Eloah that he is able to do some things and unable to do others. We have therefore believed that the body will be raised again, for although it be dissolved, it is not perished, for the earth receives its remains and preserves them. And while they are like seed and are mixed among the more fruitful soil, they flourish, and what is sown indeed, or is indeed sown, bear grain. But at the mighty sound of Elohim the Creator, the, the mighty sound of Elohim the Creator, it will sprout up. And if anyone's familiar, Scripture is clear about saying he spoke and it came to be. <clears throat> and scientifically, it, it's a fact, it's known, it's demonstrably provable that everything's held together by different frequencies. So it's the mighty sound of the creator that causes that. And that's why it says that we're all held together. We're by the word of his power, right? It says it will sprout up <clears throat> and be raised in a clothed and splendorous condition, though not before it has been dissolved and mixed so that we have not rashly believed the resurrection of the body. For although it be dissolved for a time, on account of the original transgression, it still, or it exists still, and is cast into the earth as into a potter's furnace, in order to be formed again, not in order to rise again such as it was before, 
but in a state of purity, and so as never to be destroyed any more. And to every body shall its own inner being be restored. And when it has clothed itself with that body, it will not be subject to misery, but being itself pure, it will continue with its pure body and rejoice with it, with which it having walked righteously now in this world, and never having had it as a snare, it will receive it again with great gladness. But as for the unrighteous, they will receive their bodies not changed, not freed from diseases or distempers, nor made splendorous, but with the same diseases wherein they died, and such as they were in their unbelief, the same shall they be when they shall be steadfastly judged. For all men, the righteous as well as the unrighteous, shall be brought before El Debar, or El the Word. For to him has the Father committed all judgment. And he, in order to fulfill the will of his Father, shall come as judge, whom we call Mashiach. For Minos and Ramadam. Randomathus are not the judges as you Greeks do suppose. But he whom Elohim and the Father has esteemed, concerning whom we have elsewhere given a more particular account for the sake of those who seek after truth. <clears throat> this man, exercising the righteous judgment of the Father towards all men, has prepared a righteous sentence for every one according to his works, at whose judgment seat, when all men and messengers and demons shall stand, they will send forth one voice and say, Righteous is your judgment. The rejoinder to which will bring a righteous sentence upon both parties, by giving righteously to those that have done well an everlasting fruition, but allotting to the lovers of wicked works eternal punishment. To these belong the unquenchable fire, and that without end, and a certain fiery worm never dying, and not destroying the body, but continuing its eruption out of the body with never ceasing grief. Neither will sleep give ease to these men, nor will the night afford them comfort, Death will not free them from their punishment, nor will the interceding prayers of the kindred of their kindred rather profit them. For the righteous are no longer seen by them, nor are they thought worthy of remembrance. But the righteous shall remember only their righteous actions, whereby they have obtained the Malkuth Shemaim, or the kingdom of heavens. And <clears throat> this is where we'll have no more remembrance of, of evil and no more tears, if you recall. In which there is no sleep, no sorrow, no corruption, no care, no night, no day measured by time, no sun driven in his course along the circle of Shamayim by necessity and measuring out the bonds and conversions of the seasons for the better illumination of the life of men. No moon decreasing and increasing or introducing a variety of seasons, nor will she then moisten the earth. No burning sun, no bear turning around the pole. And the bear is what we give the common <clears throat> the, the common names today, but that's not what it was called by him. All right, this is just so you have a reference of what's being spoken of. This was the bear would be the larger sheepfold. <clears throat> Orion, if you go by antiquity, was the mighty hunter, or that would have been the picture of Nimrod in the sky. But it's also in Revelation, the one that was holding the little book, if you will and representing the coming of his word in creation. So two different pictures there. And then Orion means the light bearer 
if you recall. No Orion to rise, no wandering of innumerable stars. The earth will not then be difficult to be passed over, nor will it be hard to find out the court of paradise. Nor will there be any fearful roaring of the sea, forbidding the passengers to walk on it. Even that will be made easily passable to the righteous, though it will not be void of moisture meaning we'll all be able to walk on water. <clears throat> Shemaim will not then be uninhabitable by men, and it will not be impossible to discover the way of ascending thither. The earth will not be uncultivated, nor require too much labor of men, but will bring forth its fruits of its own accord, and will be well adorned with them. There will be no more generations of wild beasts, nor will the substance of the rest of the animals shoot out any more, for it will not produce men, but the number of the righteous will continue and never fail, together with righteous messengers and spirits of El, and with his word, as a choir of righteous men and women that never grow old, and continue in an incorruptible state, singing hymns to Elohim, who has advanced them to that happiness by the means of a regular institution of life, with whom the whole creation also will lift up a perpetual hymn from corruption to incorruption, as esteemed by a splendid and pure Ruach. It will not then be restrained by the bond of necessity, but with a lively freedom shall offer up a voluntary hem, and shall praise him that made them, together with the messengers and ruachoth, or spirits, and men now freed from all bondage. And now if you nations will be persuaded by these motives, and leave your vain imaginations about your pedigrees, and gaining of riches and philosophy, and will not spend your time about subtleties of words and thereby lead your minds into error. And if you will apply your ears to the hearing of the inspired foretellers, the interpreters of both Elohim and of his word, and will believe in Elohim, you shall both be partakers of these things and obtain the good things that are to come. You shall see the ascent unto the immense Shemaim plainly, and that Malkuth, or kingdom, which is there. For what Elohim has now concealed in silence will be made then made manifest. What neither eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, the things that Elohim has prepared for them that love him. And if you remember, Kepha mentions the same thing, that when the firmament is melted away, the Malkuth, the, the Shemaim of Shemaims will come down. The eternal will be visible to those that are worthy to see it. In whatsoever ways I shall find you, in them shall I judge you entirely. So cries the end of all things. And he who has at first lived a virtuous life, but towards the latter end falls into vice, these labors by him before endured shall be altogether vain and unprofitable. And a perfect example of that is Noach's children. They started off pious following the example of their father. They kept the eternal festivals that were in, it, established by their father for 350 years with them. And afterwards, they turned from it. They turned from what they were enjoined to do, and they did all things contrary to that. And it profited them nothing that they walked right for so long beforehand because they didn't repent. This is even as in a play brought to an ill catastrophe. Whosoever shall have lived wickedly and luxuriously may repent, however, there will be need of much time to conquer an evil habit. And even after repentance, his whole life must be guarded with great care and diligence, 
after the manner of a body which, after it has been a long time afflicted with a distemper and requires a stricter diet and method of living. For though it may be possible perhaps to break off the chain of our irregular affections at once, yet our amendment cannot be secured without the favor of Elohim, the prayers of good men, the help of the brethren, and our sincere repentance and constant care. It is a good thing not to sin at all. It is also good having sinned to repent, as it is best to have health always, but it is a good thing to recover from a distemper. To Eloah be esteem and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, sorry about that. We had a little bit of break, uh, questions and, and talking about stuff, but we're going to continue here with the recognitions of Clement. And we are reading from book 10. This is chapter 47. This is after Clement, then Aquila and Nesita, all in that order, at the instigation of Kepha, in his presence had spoken about the Greek mythology, the beliefs of the pagans or the, the nations around them, and the, the folly and error of it. After that, Kepha was doing his preaching, and this is still his continuation of that. We're on a trustworthy saying, worthy of all acceptation. It says, yet if anyone desires to learn exactly the truth of our preaching, let him come to hear. Let him ascertain what the true foreteller, Yahushua, is, and then at length all doubtfulness will cease to him, unless, with obstinate mind, he resists those things that he finds to be true. For there are some whose only object is to gain victory, or the, excuse me, to gain the victory in any way whatever. And who praise, or sorry, and who seek praise for this rather than their deliverance. These ought not to have a single word addressed to them, lest both the noble word suffer injury and condemn to ageless death him who is guilty of the wrong done to it. Now, he's given an example right here that those that are only trying to win an argument and not trying to seek what is true for the deliverance of their inner being, like how Simon the magician was behaving after the course of time and it, was, it became evident. You ought not to give them anything of the, the things of that nature. Another example of this is in the Testament of Yahuda, where he mentions he was enjoined by Yahuwah not to reveal the secrets of the kingdom or the good news to, and it wasn't called that at the time, but he wasn't supposed to give the secrets of the kingdom to his wife who was of the land of Canaan, the seed of Canaan. He did so anyways, and he had problems in his life because he had married her. You can read about it to find out more. It's also in the common scriptures. But back on track here. It says, these ought not to have a single word addressed to them, lest both the noble word suffer injury and condemn to ageless death him who is guilty of the wrong done to it. For what is there in respect of which anyone ought to oppose our preaching, or in respect of which the word of our preaching is found to be contrary to the belief of what is true and honorable? Now, someone might think that's weird, that you would not, for the benefit of another, especially one so wayward, tell them the things that are of the kingdom for their fear and turning. But you have to keep in mind, he established this fact, where he said, you don't throw your pearls before dogs and, or pigs and dogs. All right? And the analogies given in scripture for what these things mean, he's talking about it right here. You don't, uh, and he puts it in another way. He says, to whom much is given, they have greater responsibility. 
and they'll be beaten with more. And to whom, who knows less, they'll be beaten with few. Meaning that if you know these things, you have a greater responsibility and there's more punishment in store for you for not doing it. So anyone who is wayward, who is obstinate in doing evil, has no inclination for these things, telling them that is just causing them more punishment because they're not willing to refrain from the things they're doing to begin with. All right. This is, it says Can I that, interject there? Oh, certainly, brother. Go ahead. It seems to me that there's a, a sentence you just read for there are some whose only object is to gain the victory in any way, whatever, and who seek the praise for this rather than their salvation. That sounds to me like people, believers or professing believers or professing unbelievers, uh, they get involved in this simply for the, the praise of men. Uh, I've met people who are the children of pretty effective ministers and they felt they had to get into it just for that reason and it sounds like that's who, who you know they're talking about not just those who are i don't know uh clear that up all right no problem brother so you had there are two groups and they're also right there in scripture you had those that are like Simon the Magician, who were seeking only to win the argument in the debate with Simon, with uh, Shimon Kepha when they were doing their disputes earlier in the book. And then with our Mashiach himself, you have the examples of the scribes and Pharisees, where they're not looking to seek after what is true for the sake of learning it and conforming their themselves to it, but trying to trip them up so as to catch him and, and get him condemned so they can get after him. And, they wanted him to get punished because they didn't like what they were hearing. They went at him trying to win arguments and trying to get one up on him instead of seeking what is true. And he was constantly correcting. Well, how would you how would you translate that into people who profess to be believers today? It's the same thing like the scribes and Pharisees. They say that they do, but they lie. They keep traditions of men instead of his word. They hear but don't do. It's all throughout the renewed covenant. It, the problem is, again, brother, it's the same thing. People, if they do not, and this is true for everybody, if you do not repent of the things that you overtly know to be true. So anything that you've read, like if you've read the, the Bible and you've seen that Yahushua himself said that, I have not come to abolish the law or the Torah, but to establish it. And then he goes through in great detail in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, just what he means by that, where now adultery is not just the physical act, but lusting in your mind is the same and will be accounted for it. Stealing and is not just, you know, the physical coveting carries over into actual sin for you. We're, we're to tame the mind, not just the body. But he never changed those things that he established that were eternal. The ones, that, if anyone wants to, to know for certain, the apostolic constitutions goes into great detail about it. You cannot, for, you cannot miss the difference in, between the eternal covenant and then the added bonds because of transgression. And then when we go through the book of Exodus, we'll, you'll see that it's a little out of order. But once you correct that, it's very plain what happened and then what was given eternally for a covenant for the people. And then what was added after he after the golden calf incident. Right now, it's kind of mudded up because the, the chapters are out of order. And like I said, we'll get there later on. But did you have... Could I, uh, yeah. It, I'm trying to put this in as, as succinct as I can in today's situation. Mm -hmm. There are or appears to be, uh, I could, uh, at a young, as a younger man, have decided that I really liked architecture or chemistry and uh, gone to great lengths, including receiving, receiving uh, your bachelor's, going on for the master's and 
because I find it fascinating and have the ability, I go and pick up my doctorate. Now that I have this doctorate, but it could be in any discipline, including theology. And herein is, is the, the problem that I see. Because our society views the word church not as it should be, uh, they're talking about individual little groups. There are people who may have tremendous um, uh, credentials and be very fluent, yet not really know him. Or they may have started with the best of intent. And as they went along and received the claim of men, after a while, it was the acclaim that they were working for, not the father anymore. Do you, you see what I'm trying to say? I think that is more common than we might admit. And we really hate to, to uh, diminish the achievements of a person who has received his doctorate in theology, but that doesn't mean that he understands, you know, he may have all kinds of wisdom, but no understanding because the understanding comes from the spirit. And if he doesn't have that, then all he has is education. All right, well, that's a lot of stuff that really is beyond what we should be worrying about on, on Shabbat because it goes into a lot of things that are just not profitable at the moment. But to, to answer your question as quickly as I can, we've had 500 years of infiltration of counter-reformation where they've intentionally perverted things and twisted stuff and ruined the education. So what you have going out now is no longer beneficial to others. Um, that was intentional. It was also foretold beforehand where you had the intermixture of Edom with the believers and then Edom reigning over them, the people suffering because of it. Edom is Rome, and Rome in its papal state is like Esau, who was born in the womb with Yaakov, but rose up against his brother and hated him from the heart after he had promises and, and instruction not to. And this is seen in Yobelim and other places as well. But um, that, that's why these things are happening. Um, what you read... I didn't mean to get you off track. That's okay. But I'm, I'm trying to point it back. You can see you can see these parallels in Scripture. You can see exactly what happened and what what is happening. And why? Because of the events that already took place. You can't change people's minds. However, you, you, anyone like Simon the Magician, anyone, um, and this is going to Irenaeus is against heresies, the five books there. He goes in the best detail about this. But there's three types of believers. Psalm 1 says, Ashray or prosperous, happy are the perfect in the way. No, that's the wrong one. Happy are those who do not stand in the place of sinners, who do not walk in the way of the wicked, and do not sit in the seat of the scoffers. Or sorry, I had that backwards. Walk in the way of the wicked, stand in the seat, stand in the place of sinners, and sit in the seat of the scoffer or pestilential. I, my apologies. And Irenaeus explains it as the three ways, also alluding to the animals. This is in the epistle of Barnabas as well. I don't mean to be confusing. I'm only mentioning these different places that you can go look later and read them and see that they're there as well. But um, the allusions to the dietary instructions and what they represent also with that psalm right there was that those that walk in the way of sinners or that, that do not know his instructions and do evil, the ones that stand in the, in the way of the wicked are those that know the Torah but don't walk in it. And then the seat of the pestilential or the scoffers are those that not only walk or do evil, but teach it to others. And anyone who teaches wrong or error to another is in that category of pestilential because they're not just disease-ridden themselves, but they're spreading it. And anyone who's doing that, if you read the end of this book, and there's a letter from Kepha to Yaakov where he talks about 
don't share these things with everybody. You got to keep it to yourself. The doctrine of reserve is what is titled. They make it clear anyone who's leading others to destruction, they deserve to go there themselves. So the uh, and the gist behind that is Kepha said, don't just give my writings out to everybody, but do like Moshe did with the elders before the mount and make them swear to be obedient to the one that's giving them that stuff or else, right? And they don't swear oaths anymore, but they adjured and they gave the Shamayim earth and air as witness that they were going to always be obedient to the one who gave them the scrolls so that they don't deviate from the truth in them. It was very important they didn't teach contrary or different than what was being enjoined for the very reasons they would be pestilential. Right. Um, that kind of thing, I, I can't see carrying over anywhere different. That was established by people who were indwelled with the Ruach. And if it's his will that men that are teaching others to go to hell forever don't have a chance at life unless they fix that. It's the same with truth. Everything that you send, you realize you have to restore things, just not going on a tangent, but it's the same principle, just very simple. If you steal from another, you have to repay them. You have to restore it. Or if you don't restore that, you have because you can't, you have to give to the poor in restitution to help appropriate to, to get your sins forgiven. You you need to remedy it, not just ask and say, I'm sorry. He says, if you remember that if someone has something against you, leave your offering and go make it right and then come. So if you've stolen from somebody, you have to restore it. And depending on how it works, depending on what the value is, there's different ways if it's double or if it's whatever. But you need to do the restitution with men and then ask forgiveness. The same is true if you're leading people astray and if you're teaching error and you're causing countless thousands to believe wrongly to the detriment of their inner being, um, you have a lot of fixing to do if you're able to before you can actually be forgiven because you reap what you sow. Does that make sense? Says, for there are some whose only object is to gain the victory in any way whatever and who seek praise for this rather than their deliverance these ought not to have a single word addressed to them least both the noble word suffer injury and condemn to ageless death him who is guilty of the wrong done to it for what is there in respect of which anyone ought to oppose our preaching or in respect of which the word of our preaching is found to be contrary to the belief of what is true and honorable. It says that Yahuwah the Father, the creator of all, is to be honored as also his son, who alone knows him and his will, and who alone is to be believed concerning all things that he has enjoined. For he alone is the Torah and the Torah giver. The Torah, the word, and the one who gave it, meaning he's the one that spoke from Mount Sinai in the burning pillar of fire, which is also what you can directly read in the apostolic constitutions and is what is alluded to all throughout the scriptures. And the righteous judge whose laws decrees that Yahuwah, who is Elohim of all, is to be honored by a sober, chaste, righteous, and merciful life. And that all hope or expectation is to be placed in him alone. But someone will say that precepts of this sort are given by the philosophers also nothing of the kind for they do indeed give commandments concerning justice and sobriety but they are ignorant that elohim is the recompenser of good and evil deeds and therefore their laws and precepts only shun a public accuser but cannot purify the conscience 
For why should one fear to sin in secret who does not know that there is a witness and a judge of secret things? Besides, the philosophers in their precepts add that even the Elohim, or mighty ones, who are demons, are to be honored. And this alone, even if in other respects they seemed worthy of approval, is sufficient to convict them of the most dreadful disobedience and condemn them by their own sentence, since they declare indeed that there is one Elohim, yet command that many be worshipped by way of humoring human or man's error. But also the philosophers say that Elohim is not angry, not knowing what they say. For anger is evil when it disturbs the mind so that it loses right counsel. But that anger that punishes the immoral does not bring disturbance to the mind. But it is one and the same affection, so to speak, which assigns rewards to the good and punishment to the evil. For if he should bestow Barak oath or blessings upon the good and the evil, and confer equal rewards upon the obedient and the disobedient, he would appear to be unrighteous rather than good. <clears throat> but you say, neither ought Elohim to do evil. You say truly, nor does he. But those who have been created by him, while they do not believe, they are to be judged. Indulging their pleasures, have fallen away from obedience and righteousness. But you will say, if it is right to punish the immoral, they ought to be punished immediately when they do immorally. You indeed do well to make haste, but he who is ageless and from whom nothing is secret, inasmuch as he is without end, in the same proportion is his patience extended. And he regards not the swiftness of vengeance, but the causes of deliverance. For he is not so much pleased with the death as with the conversion of a sinner. And just so you know, that's another reason why you don't just tell them these secret things when they're contrary to the truth. You don't go spilling the beans and giving them the pearls of the kingdom until they repent of the known evils, right? So if someone's do, committing adultery or fornication, if they're actively a thief, right? If they go around slandering or murdering people with their, with their mouths all the time, that needs to be addressed and fixed so that they repent of it. And then giving them the secrets of the kingdom, the, the good news to which they are deserving. And they can be partakers of because it'll, it'll be um, one with their being, if you will, right? In a more practical way of explaining it, the shepherd of Hermas says that when you change the ways that you behave, when you fight that inclination that you might have that is contrary to what's good, that allows the Ruach to dwell in you and not and increase and be it free to serve his maker as he pleases. But when you sin, it seeks to be straightened while you're crooked and leave you. And then you're indwelled with the wrong Ruach or the evil one and you're doing things contrary to what's good. I believe it's the Testament of Asher. Also goes into a little bit of this about there's two sides to everything, but he goes into detail about how some things can be partly good and partly evil. And that's really just practical experience with having the two spirits warring within you. Or there's another thing where if you try to do good things, but you are indwelled with Satan or a demon, those good things will be turned to a bad account, like we'd explained earlier. <clears throat> but to continue, it says, Therefore, in short, he has bestowed upon men set apart immersion, what they call baptism or mikvah, right? To which, if anyone makes haste to come and for the future remains without stain, all his sins are thenceforth blotted out which were committed in the time of his ignorance. For what have the philosophers contributed to the life of man 
by saying that Elohim is not angry with men. They only teach them to have no fear of any punishment or judgment, and thereby take away all restraint from sinners. Or what have they benefited the race of man, who have said that there is no Elohim? And this is a real smack in America's face right now, because we've been going through 40 years or more of atheism. And we're reaping that, right? But that all things happen by chance and accident. What but those men hearing this and thinking that there is no judge, no guardian of things, are driven headlong without fear of anyone to every deed that either rage or greed or lust may dictate. For they truly have much benefited the life of man who have said that nothing can be done apart from Genesis or fate. That is, that everyone ascribing the cause of his sin to fate might in the midst of his crimes declare himself innocent, while he does not wash out his guilt by repentance, but doubles it by laying the blame upon fate. And what will I say of those philosophers who have maintained that the Elohim or the mighty ones are to be worshipped, and such mighty ones as were described to you a little while ago? The, the ones who were typified by the, the deeds of the watchers and, and their children, right? The reasons the flood came. What else was this but to decree that vices, crimes, and base deeds should be worshipped? I am ashamed of you, and I pity you. If you have not yet discovered that these things are unworthy of belief and rebellious and disgusting, or if having discovered and ascertained them to be evil, you have nevertheless worshipped them as if they were good, yes, even the best. And brother, I, I suppose right there is an answer to your question. We can be that way and say the same plainly to their face too. Okay. But I would I would recommend you know, we all get our hearts right first and pray about it because revivals happen by the will of our creator as Charles Finney rightly knew. It says, Yahushua Mashiach, the Nevia Emmet, or the true foreteller. Then besides, of what sort is that which of the philosophers have presumed to speak even concerning Elohim, though they are mortal, and can only speak by opinion concerning invisible things or concerning the origins of the world, since they were not present when it was made, or concerning the end of it, or concerning the treatment and judgment of inner beings, sorry, spirits in the infernal regions. Yeah, so inner beings in the infernal regions. Forgetting that it belongs indeed to a reasonable man to know things present and visible, but that it is the part of foretold foreknowledge alone to know things past and things future and things invisible. These things, therefore, are not to be gathered from conjectures and opinions in which men are greatly deceived, but from belief in foretold truth as this doctrine of ours is. For we speak nothing of ourselves, nor announce things gathered by man's judgment. For this were to deceive our hearers. But we preach the things that have been committed and revealed to us by the true foreteller, Yahushua. And concerning his foretold foreknowledge and power, if any one, as I have said, desires to receive clear proofs, let him come instantly and be alert to hear. And we will give evident proofs by which he will seem not only to hear the power of foretold foreknowledge with his ears, but even to see it with his eyes and handle it with his hand. And when he has entertained a sure belief concerning him, he will without any labor take upon him the yoke of righteousness and obedience, and so great sweetness will he perceive in it 
that not only will he not find fault with any labor being in it, but will even desire something further to be added and imposed upon him. So you see, the, the, the answer to this is to direct him to the Mashiach, who is the truth. And his way, what he walked out in his life, the things that he said, that's all that Kepha is preaching. He's enjoining on them the things that he was given to, to teach, right? And that was all spoken for the benefit of Clement, Aquila, and Nasita's father, if you will. Last week, they were waking up with him and trying to talk to him after he just had the recognition of who they were. And this is a continuation of that discourse there. So it's still for his benefit that that was going on. Real quick. All right, so we have a little bit longer. We can keep reading. And he's no longer going to be preaching here, but we'll get on for it. This is Apion and Anubion. And those, just so you know, are friends of Clement's father, Festinius. And when he had said this and more to the same purpose, and had cured some who were present, who were infirm and possessed of demons, he dismissed the crowds while they gave thanks and praised Yahuwah Elohim, charging them to come to the same place on the following days also for the sake of hearing. And when we were together at home, and were preparing to eat. One entering told us that Apion Polistonesis, sorry, I butchered that, with Anubian, were lately come from Antioch and were lodging with Shimon. Then my father, when he heard this, rejoiced and said to Kepha, If you permit me, I should like to go and salute Apion and Anubian for they are great friends of mine, and it may be that I will be able to persuade a Nubian to dispute with Clement on the subject of fate or Genesis. Then Kepha said, I consent and commend you because you respect your friends, but consider how all things occur to you according to your desire by Elohim's providence. For behold, not only have the objects of proper affection been restored to you by the appointment of Elohim, meaning his wife and children, but also the presence of your friends is arranged for you. Then said my father, Truly, I consider that it is so as you say. And when he had said this, he went away to Anubian. But we sitting with Kepha the whole night, asking questions and learning on or and learning of him on many subjects <clears throat> remained awake through very delight in his teaching and the sweetness of his words and you see the same thing in the book of acts with uh, shaul on one occasion where a gentleman fell asleep fell out the window died was resurrected came back up and listened for the rest of the night before he left right he says, and when it was daybreak, Kepha looking at me and my brothers said, I wonder what has befallen your father. And while he was speaking with my, or, and while he was speaking, my father came in and found Kepha speaking to us about him. And when he had saluted, he began to apologize and to explain the reason why he had remained abroad. But we looking at him were horrified. For we saw on him the face of Shimon, yet we heard the voice of our father. And we shrank from him and cursed him. My father was astonished at our treating him so harshly and barbarously. Yet Kepha was the only one who saw his natural countenance. And he said to us, why do you curse your father? And we, along with our mother, answered him, he appears to us to be Shimon, though he has our father's voice. Then Kepha, you indeed only know his voice, which has not been changed by the sorceries. But to me also his face, which to others appear changed by Shimon's art, is known to be that of your father Fastinius. And looking at my father, he said, 
The cause of the dismay of your wife and your sons is this. The appearance of your countenance does not seem to be as it was, but the face of the detestable Shimon appears to you. Now, I want to point out something. He mentions sorceries here and not magic. Magic overtly, if you want to do witchcraft, is at the instigation of demons. It's spiritual power, right? It's demons doing it. Sorceries is using, um, you could say, alchemy or chemical processes too. So like a potion. And in a little bit, you'll read what Shimon did. All right. And while he was thus speaking, one of those returned who had gone before to Antioch and said to Kepha, I wish you to know my master Kepha, that Shimon at Antioch, doing many signs and prodigies in public, has inculcated upon the people nothing but what tends to excite hatred against you, calling you a magician, a sorcerer, a murderer and to such an extent has stirred, or he has stirred up hatred against you, that they greatly desire if they can find you anywhere, even to devour your flesh. I want to point out here, the ones who are indwelled by demons or Satan tend to accuse others of the very things that they're doing to try to deviate from where the blame should be laid. That's a common trait. And therefore, we who were sent before, seeing the city greatly moved against you, met together in secret and considered what ought to be done. And when we saw no way of getting him out of the difficulty, there came Cornelius the centurion, being sent by Caesar to the president of Caesarea on public business. Him we sent for alone, and told him the reason why we were sorrowful. And if you remember, Cornelius was also mentioned in the book of Acts. Kepha had, re had met him before, right? He gave the belief to him. All right. And entreated him that if he could do anything, he should help us. Then he most readily promised that he would straightway put him to flight. <clears throat> if only we would aid his plans. And when we promised that we would be active in doing everything, he said, Caesar has ordered sorcerers to be sought out and destroyed in the city of Rome and through the provinces, and a great number of them have been already destroyed. I will therefore give out through my friends that I am come to apprehend that magician, and that I am sent by Caesar for this purpose that he may be punished with the rest of his fraternity. Let your people, therefore, who are with him in disguise, hint to him, that's intimate or hint, as if they had heard it from some quarter that I am sent to apprehend him. And when he hears this, he is sure to take flight. Or if you think of anything better, tell me. Why need I say more? It was so done by those of ours who were with him, disguised for the purpose of acting as spies on him. And when Shimon learned that this was come upon him, he received the information as a great kindness conferred upon him by them and took to flight. He therefore departed from Antioch and, as we have heard, came hither with Athenodorus. Athenodorus, there we go. All we, therefore, who went before you, considered that in the meantime you should not go up to Antioch, till we see that if the hatred of you that he has sown among the people be in any degree lessened by his departure. Now, I want you to keep in mind where this is at that Simon's doing these things to the people. If you can recall, it doesn't cover this, but this is seven years the whole book of the recognitions began seven years after they started preaching. So they'd already gone through and built some of these assemblies up. He'd already converted Cornelius a long time ago. And some of these people were believers before and then turned away when, when Simon went through. 
all of that was a foreshadow of what would come in a larger scale later on with the Nicolaitan usurpation coming in through Antioch and the things that happened. Ob willing, anyone who's watching the anti Mishiach for dummies or is learning about those things, you'll be able to see the parallels a little better. And if you're familiar with how it works with Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and how it plays out on a larger scale in the same picture, or the Maccabees, or you could pretty much do it with different with different areas. Um, this makes more sense, and you can see it fits perfectly for that. Another way that you can see how that works for the um, the bad guys and not for the good guys, if you will, is in Revelation. And in literal history with the founding of Rome, it was a monarchy at first, then became the Republic and then dictatorship with the Caesars and then emperors and whatnot into the culminated into the papacy. Right. But um, it started with a monarchy and the seven monarchs, what they walked out with Sixtus and the, the things that happened at that time, the seven of the eighth is alluded to in Revelation mentioned with the inception of Rome with their monarchy and also culminated in a larger scale later on. So it's the same picture there. <clears throat> and then for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about that, you can see another more patterns like that with the testaments of the 12 patriarchs and then history through time, the things that they walked out. Yahusuf being sold into slavery by his brothers and then coming to prominence and, and being second in command under Pharaoh and bringing all the land and the people subservient to him was just like Ephraim and Manasseh going into the dark ages, right into the belly of the beast, coming out of that, repenting, and then being given the prominence that they were, but being used by Rome to subdue the world back to them. It was foreshadowing these things in the life of the patriarch. All right, so to get back on point, sorry about that. It says, when he who had come from Antioch had imparted this information, Kepha, looking to our father, said, Fastinius, your countenance has been transformed by Shimon, or Simon Hamag, as is evident. For he, thinking that he was being sought for by Caesar for punishment, has fled in terror and has placed his own countenance upon you so that you might be apprehended instead of him and put to death, that so he might cause sorrow to your sons. But my father, when he heard this crying out, said with tears, You have judged rightly, O Kepha, for a Nubian also, who was very friendly with me, began to inform me in a certain mysterious way of his plots. But to my determinant, I did not believe him because I had done him no harm. And when all of us among, or there's a common theme there too. If you read the original covenant writings, you have some examples of the sovereigns or the people. They're given advice or they're given warnings about things. And if they heeded it, it usually went well, or they would discover if it was true or not. And if they didn't, then they had no excuse for their, then the calamity happened to them and they had fair warning that it was going to. Um, one of the best examples for that, there's some tragic ones, but they call him Yoshiyahu or Josiah. He was going up to fight Nico as the sovereign of Mitzrayim or Egypt was going to fight someone else. And Nico sent him a message saying, Hey, this is from Yahuwah. I'm not, I'm not, worried about you i've got a battle somewhere else just leave me alone but yoshiyahu did not listen to that did not uh, just leave him be and went to go fight him anyways and he couldn't stand because it was from yahua and he fell in battle because of it but right here it says and when all of us along with my father were agitated with sorrow and weeping meantime a nubian came to us intimating to us that Shimon had fled during the night, making for Yahuda. But seeing our father lamenting and bewailing himself, and saying, wretch that I am, not to believe when I heard that he is a magician, what has befallen wretched me, that on one day being recognized by my wife and my sons, 
I have not been able to rejoice with them, but have been rolled back to the former miseries that I endured in my wandering. But my mother, tearing her disheveled hair, bewailed much more bitterly. We also confounded at the change of our, of our father's countenance were, as it were, thunderstruck and besides ourselves and could not comprehend what was the matter. Now, just for clarity, when he went there and he saw Simon, he knew that that was the magician, but he went and stayed there anyways. That's what he's saying. Ah, well, I should have, I should have believed and took off. And because he chose to associate and go along with that crowd, this was able to happen to him. And you can see that there's a remedy for it. But if you remember, Scripture is very clear that all things work to the good of those who love Elohim and to those who are called according to purpose. And Clement, Aquila, Nisita, and their mother all love Elohim. And this is working towards their good. So if you watch, you see. But Anubian, seeing us all thus afflicted, stood like one dumb. Then Kepha, looking at us, his sons, said, Believe me that this is your very father. So also I charge you that you respect him as your father, for Elohim will afford some opportunity on which he will be able to put off the countenance of Shimon and to recover the manifest figure of your father that is his own. Then turning to my father, he said, I gave you leave to salute Apion and Anubian, who you said were your friends from boyhood, but not that you should speak with Shimon. Then my father said, I confess I have sinned. Then said Anubian, I also with him beg and entreat of you to pardon the old man, good and noble man as he is. It is sad that he was seduced and imposed upon by the magician in question, for I will tell you how the thing was done. When he came to salute us, it seemed by coincidence that at that very time we were standing around him hearing him tell that he intended to flee away that night, for that he had heard that some persons had come even to this city of Laodicea <clears throat> to apprehend him by command of the emperor, but that he desired to turn all their rage against this Fastinius, who has lately come hither. And he said to us, Only you make him sup with us, and I will com compound a certain ointment, meaning it, that's why he called it sorceries, okay, with which when he has supped, he will anoint his face, and from that time he will seem to have all, or to all to have my countenance. But you first anoint your faces with the juice of a certain herb, that you may not be deceived as to the change of his countenance so that to all except you he will seem to be Shimon. And when he said this, I said to him, And what advantage will you gain from this deed? Then Shimon said, In the first place that those who are seeking me may lay hold of him, and so give over the search for me. But if he be punished by Caesar, that his sons may have much sorrow who forsook me and fled to Kepha, and are now his assistants. Now I confess to you, Kepha, what is true. I did not dare then tell Fastinius, but neither did Shimon give us opportunity of speaking with him in private and disclosing to him fully Shimon's design. Meantime, about the middle of the night, Shimon has fled away, making for Yahuda. And Athenodorus and Apion have gone to convey him. But I pretended bodily indisposition that I might remain at home and make him return quickly to you. If he may in any way be concealed with you, lest being seized by those who are in quest of Shimon, he be brought before Caesar and perish without cause. And now, in my anxiety about him, I have come to see him and to return before those who have gone to convey Shimon come back. 
And turning to us, a Nubian said, I, a Nubian, indeed see the true countenance of your father, because I was previously anointed by Shimon himself, as I have told you, that the real face of Fastinius might appear to my eyes, whence I am astonished and wonder at the art of Shimon Hamag, or Simon the magician, because you standing here do not recognize your father. And while my father and mother and all of us wept for the things that had befallen, a Nubian moved with compassion also wept. Then Kepha moved with compassion, promised that he would restore the face of our father, saying to him, Listen, Fastinius, as soon as the error of your transformed countenance will have conferred some advantage on us, we will have underserved and will have underserved the designs that we have in view. Then I will restore to you the true form of your countenance, on condition, however, that you first dispatch with what I will command you. And when my father promised that he would with all his might fulfill everything that he might charge him with, provided only that he might recover his own countenance. Kepha thus began, <clears throat> You have heard with your own ears that one of those who had been sent before us has returned from Antioch and has told us how Shimon, while he was there, stirred up the multitudes against me and inflamed the whole city into hatred of me, declaring that I am a magician and a murderer and a deceiver, so that they are eager if they see me even to eat my flesh. Do therefore what I tell you, leave, excuse me, leave Clement with me, and go before us to Antioch with your wife and your sons Fastus and Fastinus, and I will also send others to you or with you, whom I think fit, who will observe whatsoever I command them. When therefore you come with them to Antioch, as you will be thought to be Shimon, stand in a public place and proclaim your repentance, and say, I, Shimon, declare to you, and confess that all that I said concerning Kepha was false. For he is neither a seducer, nor a magician, nor a murderer, nor any of those things that I spoke against him. But I said all these things under the instigation of madness. I therefore entreat you, even I myself, who a short time ago gave you causes of hatred against him, that you think no such thing concerning him. But lay aside your hatred, cease from your indignation. Become, or because he is truly sent by Elohim for the deliverance of the world, a taught one and emissary of the true foreteller. So I advise, exhort, and charge you that you hear him and believe him when he preaches to you the truth. Least if you despise him, your very city suddenly perish. But I will tell you why I now make this confession to you. This night, a messenger of Elohim rebuked me for my immorality. And you see, he's telling, he's telling Fastinius what to say. And while that could be deceptive because he's there, he's speaking for the voice of Shimon, this very night a messenger rebuked him for his immorality for not doing the thing that he should. And so he this is a self-confession that he actually realizes too. And it's through this act of repentance of the thing that he did that he's he's forgiven. So it's the same principle we were just talking about. This is this night a messenger of Elohim rebuked me for my immorality and scourged me terribly because I was an enemy to the herald of the truth. Therefore, I entreat you that even if I myself should ever again come to you and attempt to say anything against Kepha, you will not receive nor believe me. For I confess to you, I was a magician, a seducer, a deceiver. But I repent, for it is possible by repentance to blot out former evil deeds. 
When Kepha made this intimation or hint to my father, he answered, I know what you desire. Do not trouble yourself further, for I comprehend and know what I am to undertake when I come to the place. And Kepha gave him further instruction, saying, When therefore you come to the place and see the people turned by your discourse and laying aside their hatred and returning to their longing for me, send and tell me, and I will come immediately. And when I come, I will without delay set you free from this strange countenance and restore to you your own, which is known to all your friends. And having said this, he ordered my brothers to go with me. And at the same time, our mother, Mathedia, and some of our friends. But my mother refused to go along with him and said, it seems as if I should be an adulteress if I were to associate with the countenance of Shimon. But if I be compelled to go along with him, it is at all events impossible that I can lie in the same bed with him. But I do not know if I can consent even to go with him. And when she stoutly refused, a Nubian began to exhort her, saying, Believe me and Kepha, but does not even his voice persuade you that he is your husband Fastinius, whom truly I love not less than you do? And in short, I also myself will come with you. And when a Nubian had said this, my mother promised that she would go with him. Then said I, Elohim arranges our affairs to our liking, for we have with us a Nubian, an astrologer, with whom if we come to Antioch, we will dispute with all earnestness on the subject of fate or Genesis. And when our father had set out, after the middle of the night, with those whom Kepha had ordered to accompany him, and with a Nubian, in the morning before Kepha went to the discussion, those men returned who had conveyed Shimon, namely Appion and Athenodorus, and came to us inquiring after my father. But Kepha, when he was informed of their coming, ordered them to enter, and when they were seated, they asked, Where is Fastinius? Kepha answered, We do not know. For since the evening that he, he sent or that he went to you, no one of his friends has seen him. But yesterday morning, Shimon came inquiring of him, and because we gave him no answer, I know not what he meant. But he said that he was fastinious. But when nobody believed him, he went and lamented and threatened that he would destroy himself, and afterwards he went away towards the text ends here, not saying where. Now, um, just so you know, I can't, I can't rightly believe that Kepha would say this. And you see the text ends, meaning that it was not, it was not actually given. But earlier, Kepha himself says that he couldn't lie for anybody's benefit. Because lying is something we're, we're enjoined not to do, but to speak truth, each one to our neighbor, right? So this might be one of those things where there's a little bit of a, a, a error in the translation. There's a few places like that in this book and pretty much everywhere in scripture, depending on where you're looking or who translated it. All right, we're almost finished here for today, I think. But I wanted to finish this section with uh, the, a happy conclusion, if you will. When Apion heard this and those who were with him, they raised a great howling, saying, Why have you done this? Why did you not receive him? And when Athenodorus was going to tell me that it was my father, Fastinius himself, Apion prevented him and said, We have learned from someone that he has gone with Shimon. And that at the entreaty of Fastinius himself, being unwilling to see his sons, because they are Yahudim. When therefore we heard this, we came to inquire after him here. But since he is not here, it appears that he must have spoken truly, who told us that he has gone with Shimon. 
This therefore we tell you, but I, Clement, when I comprehended the designs of Kepha, that he desired to make them suppose that the old man would be required at their hands, so that they might be afraid and flee away, I began to aid his design, and said to Apion, Listen, dear Apion, what we believe to be good, we desire to deliver to our father also. But if he will not receive it, but rather, as you say, flees away through abhorrence of us, it may be harsh to say so, but we care nothing about him. And when I had said this, they departed cursing my cruelty and followed the track of Shimon, as we learned on the following day. Meantime, while Kepha was daily, according to his custom, teaching the people, and working many miracles and cures, after ten days came one of our people from Antioch, sent by my father, informing us how my father stood in public, accusing Shimon, whose face indeed he seemed to wear, and extolling Kepha with unmeasured praises, and commending him to all the people, and making them long for him, so that all were changed by his speech and longed to see him, and that many had come to love Kepha so much that they raged against my father in his character of Shimon, and thought of laying hands on him, because he had done such wrong to Kepha. So said he, Make haste, lest he be murdered, for he sent me with speed to you, being in great fear, to ask you to come without delay, that you may find him alive, and also that you may appear at the favorable moment when the city is growing in affection towards you. He also told us how, as soon as my father entered the city of Antioch, the whole people were gathered to him, supposing him to be Shimon, and he began to make public confession to them all according to what the restoration of the people demanded. For many... As many came, or as came, sorry, for all, as many as came, both noble and common, both rich and poor, hoping that some miracles would be wrought by him in his usual way, he addressed thus It is long that the, or it is long that Elohim's patience bears with me, Shimon, the most miserable of men. For whatever you have wondered at in me was done not by means of truth, but by the lies and tricks of demons, that I might subvert your belief and condemn my own inner being. I confess that all things that I said about Kepha were lies. For he was never, or for he never was either a magician or a murderer, but has been sent by Elohim for the deliverance of you all. And if from this hour you think that he is to be despised, be assured that your very city may suddenly be destroyed. But you will ask, what is the reason that I make this confession to you of my own accord? I was vehemently rebuked by a messenger of Elohim this night and most severely scourged because I was his enemy. Now, if you're not familiar, in one of the books of the Maccabees, there's an actual reference to that very thing happening. Someone had went to one of the kings of the, of the Greeks and told them that there's a whole bunch, excuse me, there's a whole bunch of money in the treasury of the, the Hekel, the, the temple. And they can go plunder it and take some for themselves. So they sent a man in to go collect the taxes for it. And he came in in deceit and then demanded the money that they said they had. And he wanted to go in and, and perceive it. He was being stopped by others, or I, I could have it mistaken, but I think I have the right story. But he was being stopped, and um, they were asking him not to. He refused to listen. And so the Kohanim, the people, the virgins, everyone prayed to have Yahuwah himself protect his place from this man that was coming in to do that. Because he wasn't alone. He was with the, uh, you know, an, an army to collect the taxes that he wanted. But as he was going into the area, messengers came and they literally started beating him. Or it, it, one reference 
has him just drop down. No one sees him, but he drops down convulsing. And the other one shows the messengers, they're beating him over and over again. And then um, it's the Kohen that they ask, please, please pray and have him, have him healed. So they pray and then he's restored to health. But the messengers warn him that he better go extol the praises of mighty works of Elohim because it's only for the sake of the prayers of the Kohen that his life is preserved. Right. But he says, I therefore entreat you that if from this hour, even I myself will ever open my mouth against him, you will drive me from your sight for that foul demon who is an enemy to the deliverance of men speaks against him through my mouth that you may not obtain to life by his means. For what miracle could the magic art show you through me? I made brazen dogs bark and statues move. Men change their appearances and suddenly vanish from men's sight. And for these things you ought to have cursed the magic art, which bound your inner beings with devilish fetters, that I might show you a vain miracle, that you might not believe Kepha who cures the sick in the name of him by whom he is sent, and expels demons and gives sight to the blind and restores health to the palsied, and raises the dead. Uh, the palsy, is, I believe, is having a stroke, right? So to be paralyzed or to not be able to move a part of your body. Whilst he made these and similar statements, the people began to curse him and to weep and lament because they had sinned against Kepha, believing him to be a magician or immoral man. But the same day at evening, Fastinius had his own face restored to him by the appearance of Shimon Hamet or, and the appearance of Simon the magician left him. Now Shimon, hearing that his face on Fastinius had contributed to the esteem of Kepha, came in haste to anticipate Kepha and intended to cause by his art that his likeness should be taken from Fastinius. When Mashiach had already accomplished this according to the word of his emissary. But Nasita and Aquila, seeing their father's face restored after the necessary proclamation, gave thanks to Elohim and would not suffer him to address the people anymore. But Shimon began, though secretly, to go amongst his friends and acquaintances and to malign Kepha more than before. Then all spat in his face and drove him from the city, saying, You will be chargeable with your own death if you think of coming hither again, speaking against Kepha. These things being known at Laodicea, Kepha ordered the people to meet on the following day, and having ordained one of those who followed him as overseer over them, and others as elders, having immersed multitudes and restored to health all who were troubled with sicknesses or demons. He stayed there three days longer, and all things being properly arranged, he bade them farewell and set out from Laodicea, being much longed for by the people of Antioch. And the whole city began to hear through Nesita and Aquila that Kepha was coming. Then all the people of the city of Antioch, hearing of Kepha's arrival, went to meet him, and almost all the old men and the nobles came with ashes sprinkled on their heads, in this way testifying their repentance, because they had listened to the magician Shimon in opposition to his preaching. All right, two more, and then we'll we'll pause because it's a great. This is, if you remember, Yahushua said, "Greater things you will do because I ascend to my Father." And if you read about all the miracles that he did, and which were many and wondrous, not one of them is like what about Kef is about to experience. So check, this is pretty amazing. But it's also fulfillment of truly fulfilling what our Mashiach said. His taught ones did greater miracles than he did. 
Stating these and such like things, they bring to him those distressed with sicknesses and tormented with demons, paralytics also, and those suffering diverse perils. And there were an infinite number of sick people collected. And when Kepha saw that they not only repented of the evil thoughts they had entertained of him by means or through means of Shimon, but also that they showed so entire belief in Elohim that they believed that all who suffered from every sort of ailment could be healed by him. He spread out his hands toward the Shamayim, pouring out prayers with tears, and gave thanks to Yahuwah, saying, I barak you, Father Yahuwah, worthy of all praise, who have denied to fulfill every word and promise of your Son that every creature may know that you alone are Elohim in Shemaim and in earth. With such sayings, he went up on a height and ordered all the multitude of sick people to be ranged before him and addressed them in, or, and addressed them all in these words. As you see me to be a man like to yourselves, do not suppose that you can recover your health from me, but through him whom, coming down from Shemaim, has shown to those who believe in him a perfect medicine for body and spirit or inner being. Hence, let all this people are witnesses of your declaration that with your whole heart you believe in Master Yahushua Mashiach. That might have been Yahua, Yahushua, Mashiach, like it says in other places here and elsewhere, but they have it translated as master. This is that they may know that themselves also may be delivered by him. And when all the multitude of the sick with one voice cried out that he is the true Elohim whom Kepha preaches, Suddenly, an overpowering light of the favor of Elohim appeared in the midst of the people, and the paralytics being cured began to run to Kepha's feet, the blind to shout on the recovery of their sight, the lame to give thanks on regaining the power of walking, the sick to rejoice in restored health, even some who were barely alive, being already without consciousness or the power of speech were raised up, and all the lunatics and those possessed of demons were set free. So great favor, one more here, so great favor of his power did the Shekinah or Shekin Yah, the presence of Yahuwah, show on that day that all from the least to the greatest with one voice confessed Yahuwah and not to delay you with many words, within seven days more than 10,000 men believing in Elohim were immersed and consecrated by said apartness, so that Theophilus, who was more exalted than all the men of power in that city, with all eagerness of desire, consecrated the great palace of his house under the name of a kahal, and a chair was placed in it, for the emissary Kepha, by all the people and the whole multitude assembling daily to hear the word, believed in the heartfelt doctrine that was avouched by the efficacy of cures. So, oh, an amazing gift there. The belief, the belief of those people bringing him to tears and then having such a miracle happen from the providence in favor of Yahuwah alone, but through the means of Kepha being there. And in fulfillment, like I said, of Yahushua Mashiach saying that greater works they would do because he was ascending to his father. So thank you all for your time and you have a wonderful Shabbat. We'll have questions in uh, just a moment, but everyone else, we will see you next week. Shalom.